Uh, before I get started, uh, uh, I'm an old middle school teacher, and uh, I used to drive my kids crazy because I wandered around the classroom and lecture and things. So if I start to wander, call me back in. Uh, the other thing is, uh, every time I come to Alaska Miners, I'm reminded of a little friend of mine, Luke Tallier, who used to love to come to the Alaska Miners and talk about things. He says, it doesn't matter how outrageous you uh, your claims are, he says, they never ask questions. <laughs> I hope you guys ask lots of questions. Um, I, uh, I moved to uh, Wrangell in, in uh, I live in Wrangell, which is about seven miles south of Juneau. And uh, in 1994, and I uh, decided to become a shipwright. So I bought a small boat job and learned how to become a shipwright and cut my fingers off and things. Uh, but I uh, always had a, a love for geology, so I started prospecting uh, with Phil Beardsley over on the Wolski Island in the Canal. And then uh, I migrated to uh, Zaremba Island, uh, south of Petersburg and west of Wrangell, and started prospecting uh, that part of the world. I, what I want to uh, do today is, is sort of set the stage for uh, how uh, inversion techniques uh, change the story uh, as far as the geophysics goes and also as maybe as, as far as uh, what the true potential uh, for tonnage is. Our, our problem on, uh, in this part of the world is not grade. Uh, grades everywhere, it's tonnage. We haven't been able to find tonnage. And, uh, hopefully uh, you'll get a sense of where we're at. And where we're going. Um, uh, in the spring of uh, 2016, I had a, a, an offer to, to take a bucket line uh, or a bucket list uh, trip uh, with my son, who was a senior exploration geologist for a poor uh, underground at, at uh, Kensington. And uh, it was a uh, corgasmic day. I it was a great day. We spent the whole day underground. And uh, I learned a lot, actually. Uh, well, if you ever get a chance to wander around a core, a course facility take it. It's, uh, it's a spectacular tour. We were, uh, actually got to go up into the Raven Zone, which uh, most people don't get to go up because you have to crawl up this 300-foot ladder to get there. And they're doing old slush mining techniques. And uh, it was uh, very uh, uh, educational for me because I've never been in that service of a setting before. But if you ever get a chance to go on one of their tours, uh, take it. It's worth it. Um, normal cautionary uh, uh, statement, I, uh, I'll probably get carried away uh, and say some outrageous things. Uh, don't, take them, don't take them to heart, especially about grade. Uh, I get excited when we start talking about grade, so anyway. Um, Zarembo Island is uh, located uh, west of Wrangell, about 12 miles, and in, in southeast of Alaska. Um, uh, it's, it's an interesting place. It was named for a navigator uh, in the early Russian days in about uh, 1840. Uh, he was, uh, this navigator was also making maps and, and decided to, to name this island after himself. So anyway, that's how that works. Uh, this is Wrangell, mm -hmm. tiny town, about 2,500 people on a good day. Uh, we have International Airport. The only thing we can say is that uh, the president can't land here because it's too short. And, uh, but anyway, we're a port of entry uh, for Canadian uh, uh, ventures, and uh, we also uh, uh, have as many uh, churches in town as we do bars. Uh, this is a good day, right? We're not all that way, by the way. Uh, standard uh, quarter mile sheet. Uh, this is uh, Zarembo Island. Here's Wrangell. Here's Petersburg. We don't talk about Petersburg, especially during the basketball season. Uh, but uh, French is located on the northwest corner of, uh, of uh, Zarembo Island. Uh, 
Regionally, uh, Southeast Alaska is made up of a series of amalgamated terrains, if you will. I like to use this map that I put out by Ryan Newberry and, and Dave Rubin, I think, in uh, 99, 97, 97. And uh, it sort of sets the picture for, uh, for what we know about uh, Southeast Alaska. I feel a little intimidated because uh, probably the world's uh, expert on the Alexander train is sitting in the room here with uh, Sue Carl. And so if you have any uh, questions on the Alexander train, she can, she can uh, amaze you by the way that she knows. Um, the Alexander train is a uh, Triassic sequence. Uh, in, and on this map, it's in uh, sort of this funny green. So it's subdivided into two subterrains, the uh, Admiralty sub subterrain <laughs> and uh, the Craig subterrain. Uh, this train is important in Southeast because it hosts some significant mineral deposits. The uh, largest uh, silver producer in North America is located uh, right here. This is Green Street. Um, everybody knows the history of Green Street. Found by a, by a geologist walking down the street. Remember, it's a big storm. Nobody ever walked down that street before. So uh, if you get a chance to walk down streams that people haven't walked down, take it. Because you might find another Green Street. Uh, there's several other deposits uh, in the belt that are significant. There's uh, Constantine Minerals uh, as uh, the Palmer Prospect, uh, which will be talked about at, uh, in one of the technical sessions. And um, down on Prince of Wales Island on the southern end uh, is uh, uh, Heatherdale's uh, Niblack, which are probably the real deal. These are these are significant mineral deposits that will probably remind someday. Uh, not tomorrow, but uh, someday. Uh, in between, there's, uh, there's several other things. There's Pyrola and the Fremming and uh, a couple others. Uh, the French Prospect on Sarembo Island is located right here on the southern end of uh, the Admiralty uh, subterranean. And we'll focus on that for the rest of this talk. Uh, this is a wonderful map. If I could blow it up big enough, I'd have to wall it in my house to wipe it like my it. It's really wonderful. This is a map put together by uh, Sue Carl and her group uh, at the USGS. And it brought together all of the, all of the uh, quarter million scale and just two mile scale mapping that had been done in uh, the uh, Duncan Canal and the uh, Rainbow area. And then and also to the east, a little bit to the east, over toward uh, Bradfield. But it's a wonderful map. Uh, first thing you're struck by is uh, how much green is on this map. The green, the green rocks uh, here are, are, are the Triassic. And before this map came out, really uh, the exploration the industry didn't really have a, a good feeling on how much Triassic there was. And most of this uh, this dating was was done by the USGS. Uh, we didn't we haven't done any dating in our work at all. We can't afford it. But, uh, uh, this is uh, Duncan Canal. Uh, this is Frederick Sound up here. Uh, Admiralty and and uh, Admiralty Island and Green Street are in this part of the world. Right there. So this uh, this rock unit uh, comes down through uh, Duncan, jumps across Sumner Strait, which. Uh, is a nasty uh, body of water. Uh, if, you're, if you're a boat guy like I am, uh, you, will, you traverse this on a good day. Uh, we left, we left uh, Scramble one day at uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon in November, flat calm, and by the time we got to this little island right here, there were fall footers. And uh, in my 28 foot thing, that's not very good for them. So, and it, we were also in the dark, which was, was fun. Uh, I promise my kids I'd never do that again. Um, so anyway, we're gonna we're gonna focus on this part of the room right here. Uh, Frenchie's uh, Frenchie's located Frenchie the Frenchie deposit I call it. It could be a prospect. It might not be. Uh, it's located on the northeast or northwest corner of Scrambo Island. This is St. John's Harbor. Uh, deep water access. There's a there's a nice dock facility uh, right about there, but uh, they routinely bring uh, 
uh, barges in there for the logging operations. So actions for uh, bringing the equipment stuff is pretty good. Um, this is what it looked like in uh, 2013. Uh, this, is, this is what it looked like uh, at the end of the summer after uh, the loggers got after me. Uh, again, here's uh, St. John's Bay. These are all um, recent clear cuts. The nicest thing we have is road access. Uh, there's one thing you can say about this part of the world is road. Okay. It's not, it's not a roadless area by any means. And they're not done yet. They're, all of this will be locked eventually. Um, reconnaissance geology was from uh, Anybody who knows anything about the geology of Green Street will be struck by how similar the, the detailed geology is to Green Street. And that's not surprising it's because it's part of the part of the uh, high group and, and the Triassic section. Uh, on Zarembo, uh, we see uh, two or three major rock packages. Uh, those rock packages uh, in kind of a cubic green and, and red, including the intrusive is a part of the Gravina terrain. It's probably jurocatacious. Uh, these intrusives are, have been dated, and they're, they're also uh, cretaceous. Uh, this sort of a nice green color that comes down through the middle of the island and, and crops out here and there is uh, the high group, uh, late Triassic, I guess, best guess. My best guess. And uh, this is the host uh, to, uh, to the Green Street deposit on Admiral's Island. Well exposed in certain places on, on this rainbow. Uh, those of you that haven't worked in Southeast, uh, Southeast of the jungle, you can't, you can't breathe through the brush sometimes. I mean, that's bad news. And everything's got a thorn on it. It's after you. So uh, when you see maps like this, you have, really have to uh, Take them with a grain of salt because uh, it's, you just don't know. Okay. All, all of these contacts are, are not even approximately located here, hypothetically. A little closer look at this. Uh, this is our, our the base that we worked off of uh, for uh, our, our uh, geophysics and, and geology. Uh, Frenchie's located here on Frenchie Creek. Uh, again, St. John's Bay. Uh, this sort of a orange thing here is uh, part of the Cameron Island Formation. That's Permian, uh, mainly phyllites and, and uh, various kinds of, uh, of uh, shales and, and things. It's, a, it's a, not a very nice rock either. Uh, as far as we know, there is no known uh, economic mineralization in, in uh, the Cameron Formation. Everything that we've been working on and that, that has been exposed to date uh, lies within within these these green rocks, which are part of the uh, uh, the high group, the Triassic. What what I've been looking for, uh, and hopefully uh, we'll find one day, is where, where one of these uh, geocretaceous plutons is actually plugged into the to the uh, Triassic and make it make a really nice uh, scar. There are nine zones in here so too. So, so anyway, we've been looking for those for, uh, kind of as of late. Um, this is the discovery outcrop at Frenchies. This was uh, discovered in uh, uh, 1906 by uh, independent prospectors who were working for something called the Southeast Syndicate, which was part of the uh, Guggenheim Group. Right. Everybody looks I think that doesn't mean that the Guggenheims were building the Kennecott mine in, in uh, Cordova at this time. And they sent independent prospector to the southeast to find copper. They wanted more copper. They didn't have enough of Kennecott to do anything. They wanted a quarter of the world's market on copper. One of the independent prospectors they sent in the southeast was John Reeder's grandfather. And everybody knows who John Reeder was. He was a work from DGGS forever. He's got a PhD from Stanford. Great guy. Anyway, John Reeder's grandfather was prospecting on Sherebo Island. 
in 1906. You can imagine what that was like. And uh, they actually uh, put in a tunnel and a, and a crosscut uh, into this uh, into this exposure. And we know that uh, John Reeder's grandfather uh, has some history here because his wife's name is Frenchie. So that's where the, where the name Frenchie came from. And it's kind of a nice, uh, nice addition. Okay, here's what we have at, Fre at the Discovery Outcrop of Frenchie. We have, we have a basal uh, one and a half meters of uh, true massive sulfide, greater than 75 percent sulfide. Almost all artery. Okay. Very little uh, spalerite, very little coming out. Runs a little bit of gold. This runs about one, one gram per ton of gold. Uh, above this basal massive pyrite, which we, we believe this is, a, this is probably the main conductor at, at Frenchy, not the main conductor. This thing is a longer. Uh, above that is uh, a variable uh, thickness uh, horizon. Uh, here it's about four meters, uh, less than 75%, grading up to uh, four point eight percent zinc, uh, about one gram gold, a little bit of copper, uh, and that's about it. Uh, this thing also is probably a conductor, but not probably not quite as a bigger conductor as this basal part of the This is a nice exposure north of, uh, of the Frenchy uh, discovery outcrop. Again, uh, uh, 4.11 meters creating uh, one gram gold, up to 2.6 zinc and 2% lead. A little bit more lead on this side of the river. But, uh, this, is a, this is a sort of exposure that's fairly common along. Frenchy Creek, uh, never been drilled. Hasn't been drilled because the Forest Service wouldn't let us move our drill to the north side of the creek because of the drill was sitting on the south side. Let us take it over there. Um, good exposure of uh, the host rock at Frenchy. This is a, these are variably uh, <coughs> fractured and rehealed uh, shales and argillites. Uh, some very nice, what I think is soft sediment deformation, probably related to basal collapse during the formation of this thing. Uh, anyway. Um, this is the football of the mineralized zone of Frenchie. It's a variably altered uh, argillite or tough. You know, we're not sure what it is, but it's a tougher argillite. Uh, mineralization sits directly on this uh, layer, which is really nice because as you, as you find this particular distinctive horizon, uh, you find mineralization. So, anyway. uh, just downstream uh, to the west of the Freshy uh, Discovery Outcrop is a uh, five meter section grading 4.36 gold, 4.36 grams gold. I made a mistake, I, I made a slide that said ounce per gold one time. Be nice, but it's not true. Uh, 2016, we uh, we undertook a little program to better understand the distribution of the gold mineralization in Frenchie. Okay, um, this thing's been described and regionally has been described as a Kuroko type deposit. Well, if anybody knows about Kuroko's, Kuroko's don't have gold. In them. Okay, Cliff Taylor, USGS suggests that, that these types of deposits probably are not true corpus, but probably green creek deposits, type deposits. It has its own model, because it has this rich gold content. So we undertook a little uh, sampling program to better understand um, what the gold was hosted in and where, and, and just what it was. And, and lo and behold, we found something that was pretty surprising. All the work that's been done before People have been doing conventional uh, fire assay AA cleanup analyses. Okay? And here's how they work. Send a rock to the lab, they crush it. They, if it's too big, they split it. They pulverize the split, usually to minus 80. 
They sample the minus 80 and they analyze it. What happens if your goal is more than minus 80? What if it's plus 80? You don't, you don't sample it, right, in the analysis. And that's what we found. If you'll see, if you look here, we started doing something called metallic screen analysis. And I don't know how I decided to do this, but I just did. Oh, I know I did. I was talking to my son at, at uh, Kensington. In their QAQC program, they normally do screen analysis. They do their own fire assays, and then they take those, those samples and they send them off to a commercial lab to do metallic sieve analyses to check their fire assay procedure at the mine, which is part of their grade and tonnage uh, model and things like that. So anyway, he convinced me that we start we needed to start doing uh, metallic screens because there's a problem with coarse gold, coarse gold analyses if you don't do metallic screens. And here's what, uh, just take a look at this. Okay, here's a, here's a, uh, Here's a three foot sample right here, 3.6 foot sample that if you did a conventional um, minus 80 fraction analysis grades 1.24 ppm, 1.24 grams. If you do a metallic screen analysis, it's really 21.72 grams. <coughs> they do is they take, they take the sample, they crush it, they split it, they pulverize it, they screen it, the 80 mesh or whatever you want, sample the top screen, sample the bottom screen, analyze both, add them together, get something called total gold. That's the only fair way of doing it if you're dealing with coarse gold. Because as you pulverize something, the cross-sectional area, the cross-sectional area of the grain itself changes as you pulverize it. It gets bigger. Gold is a nasty moment to, to deal with. So anyway, I would, I would suggest anybody dealing with uh, VMS deposits that have precious metals in them, think about doing metallic screens. They're expensive. I'll tell you, they give you the real story. What do you think? Uh, everybody's got to have a model. I threw this together in about a minute. Uh, it's a fairly typical model of a Roco type deposit. At Greens Creek, the gold mineralization is located down here in the Stockwood uh, zone. Uh, pretty simplistic model. Uh, this next slide will give you an idea of how, how complicated these things are. I stole this from Hecla. Uh, this is an, an actual model. This is older, but it will give you an, uh, an idea of how complicated these systems are. These are actual uh, uh, underground renditions, if you will, of what, the, what these ore bodies look like. You can imagine trying to evaluate something like this. I think the best way to do it is to get on it and mine it. Okay. Uh, west of uh, the Discovery Outcrop, we found a uh, zone <coughs> that, that's uh, probably more than five feet thick, but we don't, we don't talk about it. In more than that, that uh, is about a 50% barrier. And if you uh, come to the uh, core shack tomorrow and Wednesday, I have, I'll have all these rocks laid out and you take a look at them. But these uh, these bearing, uh, bearing rocks are very similar to the white ore at Greenspan, I think. And uh, it makes it a nice analogy for us anyway to, to bring everything back to Green Street. Uh, is close up, uh, you get, a, get an idea that there's some sort of a breach, looks like some sort of a breach of here. But this is abandoned barite silver rock that runs uh, 11 grams. It's a, it's a nice number. Uh, 1994, the city of Wrangell, this is, you'll, you'll love this, the city of Wrangell, the BLM, and TGGS got together and decided that they, they wanted to fly some geophysics in the uh, Duncan Canal, the Wrangell area. City of Wrangell came up with $100,000 cash. BLM had $500,000 a year in money. 
uh, Ted Stevens was alive, he twisted their arm and they, they decided to, uh, to fly the Duncan Canal area and they flew 750 square miles of Duncan Canal, Groundhog Basin, and Zaremo Island. And uh, in 1994, uh, DGGS published the data in hopes that it would stimulate this economic activity in Wrangell. Nobody came. Nobody here. And uh, story of our lives. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, in 1996, uh, I, uh, I got interested in prospecting on Zaremo, so we picked up the data. I wasn't working for the state then. And uh, we started working with it. And it's a difficult, it was a difficult data set because the first thing that, that Ken and I had a problem with is figuring out what projection it was. It's not, it's not clear in some of the early stuff what projection they used to make their maps and, and to put the data out in. Uh, once we figured that out, I think, I think we settled on WGS 84 or something like that. And uh, most of these maps are WGS 84, which means that you, if you have a, uh, if you do an ARC or, or I use something called Expert GPS, it'll wash right into the, into the mapping program and, and you can make maps out of it. Um, this will give you an idea. Uh, I was sitting in my office at home and the phone rang. It was Kurt Freeman. And he, he said, Mark, I suggest you call uh, Ken at Condor and talk to him a little bit about Zarembo's geophysics. And I did, I, and uh, Ken said, send me a data set. So after a little bit of give and take, we, uh, we uh, sent him a data set of uh, this, this block of ground right here. And you'll notice uh, Frenchie is right, Frenchie's right here. And this thing corresponds to our claim block. So it was an easy thing for us to do is to to send Ken a, a little bit of a trial uh, data set. And uh, this is the Gondor uh, rendition of, of uh, the new uh, reprocess data. Re -process data. Uh, I put these ovals on here for, they're just anachromatic, uh, but they, they help me a little bit. Um, the purple, uh, these pink lines right here are uh, Condor picks for uh, electromagnetics. And these black dots, if you look, are digit picks. And you'll see that the black dots pretty much correspond, which are, are digit electromagnetic picks, OK? They, they correspond fairly well with, with the new uh, digit, or with the new, new uh, I've got a block here, uh, Condor picks. Don't go on from there. Don't go on in time. Keep going. OK. Uh, here's the data set. Again, a close up. Here's Frenchie. Uh, these are the flight lines. And uh, for some reason, uh, when uh, we designed the survey with, uh, with the BLM, we, we decided to fly east-west. And I don't know why, but it's a good thing we did. Because uh, as you'll see as we step down through the, the reprocess data, it, it, it's pretty cool. Um, again, uh, Condor picks. Uh, digim, digimix, flight lines, and your Frenchie. Uh, here's a uh, a map, if you will, map view of, uh, of magnetic. Uh, this is Aeromag Aero reprocessed, okay, Condor reprocessed, and uh, you start and. It's draped on, on geology. So here's uh, cannery formation. Uh, here's uh, this green kind of gets muddled back in here. Here's high, high group. Here's high group picking out over here again. Uh, the big intrusive up here. Uh, we end up with these these things, which are knowledge in the in the in the reprocess mapping technique. Uh, come to find out, this is a a uh, rhyolite dike swarm with. Uh, Disseminate pyrene all through it. So it's a, it's, it also has some magnetic uh, features. So uh, these things don't bother me as much as they did when I first saw the, saw the data, saw the new maps. They're, they're, uh, if you go to the field, you'll see that these things are, are uh, really young. They're young features. Uh, 
and uh, they prosecuted him. This is a this is a, uh, a map, if you will, a rendition of a, a voxel model. Now, the voxel model, uh, Abraham talked about them before. They were these same order. You have you divide the the area into shapes, if you will. Uh, these shapes are uh, 25 meter cubes, and you can load any data you want in those things. You can load magnetics into the computer, and then the computer can generate these maps for you. You, you can load geochem, you can load electromagnetics, you can load tree type if you want, if it matters, whatever you want. And then uh, you can drape them on, on uh, in this case, topography. Okay, so again, here's Frenchie, and here's, here's a voxel model of, of uh, magnetics. And you can see that Frenchy lies on the north north margin of a fairly strong magnetic anomaly, if you will. All the previous work on Zarembo, uh, and especially Frenchy, uh, I won't mention who did the work, uh, suggested that, that Frenchy did not have one of the magnetic anomaly associated with it, and it also did not have an electromagnetic anomaly. And there were uh, there was one company that did a Max Min survey. Uh, and one would think that maximum survey, if if Frenchy had truly has a electromagnetic signature, uh, would show up on a maximum survey. It didn't. Period. I've seen the data. Uh, we don't know why. We're, we're uh, probably going to investigate that a little bit this winter. Um, <coughs> again, here's a. Uh, uh, a map, if you will, uh, 3D map showing uh, the extent of uh, the electromagnetic signatures, signature associated with the height of rocks and uh, Frenchy. Uh, it's interesting, this, uh, this electromagnetic anomaly is uh, four kilometers long. Okay. It's, uh, it's a walker. Uh, and here's a map view of the same same thing, and you can see uh, uh, this is the uh, the inversion process allows you to to, to uh, create depth slices through the data and display them in, in a map form. And this is one of them. This is a 25 meter depth uh, slice of conductivity. And again, here's Frenchy. And you can see, uh, sort of squints a little bit, you can see that there's a, some sort of a trend like that, which is that, that amount that we looked at uh, in the previous slide. And then some other things popped out. Uh, I was trying to get to this one this summer, but um, there's a waterfall right here that doesn't allow you to get to there. So I'm gonna have to figure out another way to get there. Um, uh, let's go back to a voxel model. Here's a, here's a voxel model of resistivity. Uh, blues are low resist resistivity or conductive, and reds are part of the opposite. So again, here's, here's Frenchy. It sits at, sits at the northwest corner of uh, a very strong uh, resistivity model. When you combine the, the uh, voxel model for, for uh, conductivity, electromagnetics, if you will, and, and uh, magnetics, uh, you, get, you get this model. And uh, so here's, here's our friend again, uh, the electromagnetic model. And here's, uh, here's a magnetic model, the 3D, 3D version of, of, uh, of magnetics, and it appears that the magnetic Anomalies plunging to the southeast fairly quickly. Uh, in previous talks that I've given at, at Miners, we suggested that uh, we were drilling with a winky. Our deepest hole was at 120, 130 feet. 
uh, the, plunge, the plunge of this magnetic anomaly and probably uh, this coincident electromagnetic thing is, is uh, one of the reasons that we didn't see it in some sort of very far as it's not. Because it plunges really quickly and uh, gets out of range very well. Probably aren't so five minutes? Five minutes. Okay. We probably won't uh, be doing that. Uh, anyway, here's our uh, our friend again with the. Uh, we're going to step down through these through these uh, lines here really quickly. Um, the uh, inversion uh, technique allows you to do uh, depth slices through the data. Um, this is uh, the northern northernmost line, and you get a you get a sense of uh, of uh, what these anomalies look like, if you will. Uh, here's, a, here's a nice anomaly that's about uh, 3,000 uh, 3, feet long. Uh, here's an anomaly that I went after uh, up in the hills and I couldn't find it. Uh, this technique uh, allows you to drape uh, the cross sections on topography, and this, the top lines of all of these, uh, these things are, uh, all of these profiles are, are uh, topography. Again, another, uh, this is uh, the, the line, next line to the south. You can see uh, uh, this one actually uh, cross cuts uh, the location of Frenchie, which is a nice model for us. Uh, Frenchie is right here on this uh, profile, and right here on this magnetic profile. This is a magnetic. So you can see that uh, there, there is a coincident uh, deep magnetic uh, root, if you will, at Frenchie. And also a well-defined uh, conductive zone. The, sh the shape of that, when I talked to Mark about it, you're really imaging the top of the body. You, in the EM, you're not really getting any information in depth, and so it looks like a plate. But that's just the limitation of the physics of it. You're you really don't know unless you came in with a ground time domain EM system or something or a drill. Would you really know? I mean, you're better off putting geology in and saying, right, steep dip. That probably goes, if you see it at the top, it probably goes deeper down, just like the magnetic feature. Yeah, I think if we had uh, we had an unlimited budget, which we don't, uh, it would be nice to uh, to drill these things, but it's pretty risky. Uh, anybody who's been in the exploration game a long time, after you, you really, uh, if you're playing with somebody else's money, you probably shouldn't. Uh, so we're proposing that we come in with some, some sort of a, either time, time domain or electrical or uh, Domain survey, helicopter type survey, and uh, those, that should produce uh, drill rated targets, which, uh, which would be exciting. Okay, a couple minutes. Okay. Yeah. And anyway, here's, uh, here's uh, the next one to the south. And the next one to the south. So you get a sense that there are conductors, and uh, there are. There are models that look just like Frenchie. Here's again a nice blanket uh, sort of an anomaly with uh, a deep, deeply rooted uh, core magnetics. Same thing. Okay, here's our uh, exploration strategy. We want to collect more soils and rocks and continue map and then run some sort of uh, time domain or time system. Uh, anybody that's never worked in Southeast, uh, uh, there, there are benefits to working in Southeast. I'll uh, show you a few. Even old timers can catch nice king salmon every once in a while. This is about 22 pounds. It's, uh, boy, that was good eating. Uh, this is my uh, youngest uh, son, Will, uh, with a, an 18 pound cold. This is a wonder. Right yeah, good eating. Uh, here's Will with uh, a nice example of a circuit like this. John on Douglas Island, actually. Uh, here's Tom, my oldest boy. Uh, he's the first engineer on the Malaspina. Uh, this is a 95 pound helmet that he caught this spring. Even the big Tom's having trouble. And uh, we do live in a rainforest, so we get lots of uh, rainbows. Uh, this one actually uh, ends uh, over Frenchie, which may, may mean something. 
And then every once in a while, uh, this is a view out my back door uh, at home, and uh, we get nice sunsets. So come, come to Wrangell. That's fine. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. That's, that's okay. And you've got a quarter split. Yeah. All right. And anyway, uh, come to the court shack and uh, look at these rocks, and we can talk. And I have all the all this stuff on uh, posters and things. So.